We need to store our passwords safely. And the recommended way to do that in Spring Security is using an algorithm called bcrypt. In this chapter, I'll be showing you how to switch bcrypting on. But to explain why bcrypt is better than the other alternatives that you might have heard of, well, I'll wait until the next chapter to do that. But for now, let's see how to make it work. I need to be clear that storing passwords in their raw form, which are called clear text or plain text passwords, this practice is, well, I really can't say this strongly enough, really. It's an extremely negligent act and it should never be done. The reason is your data can always be stolen. It might not be anything as sophisticated as a hacker cleverly gaining access to your web application using some kind of attack that maybe gets them root access to your server. That's possible, but it's more likely that your data could be stolen by maybe a backup of your database somehow falling into the wrong hands. Of course, a proper secure backup policy is necessary but accidents can always happen. And it's a bit unpleasant to say this, but if you're anything more than a one-person company, it's always possible that a rogue, malicious employee who has full access rights to your database could simply look at the data in your database tables and then steal the usernames and passwords. It's worth thinking about why this is a very bad thing that all applications need to guard against. And I have heard even senior technology officers in large companies argue that, oh, well, the application that we're building, it's only a small application and we're not storing anything valuable like credit cards. So who cares if the data gets stolen? Let's not bother securing the passwords. But the point is that a password is always an incredibly valuable resource for any user. Remember that most people use the same password on most of the websites that they use. So even if your application isn't very sensitive, it's not storing credit cards, if a malicious individual were to in any way be able to steal the password database, then they could potentially gain access to that user's account on any other website, maybe even their online bank account. And it's worth mentioning that some banks even today still use just basic form authentication with a username and password, which I think is negligent as well, really, all banks should use extra forms of security, but a few still do that. But even if the banks are secure, our malicious individual could use a username password combination to get access to, say, a popular online store that happens to store users' credit card details, and they could buy lots of products and get them delivered to themselves. So I hope I don't sound preachy, but this course has to be very clear that protection of passwords is a necessary operation for every web app, regardless of its size or how valuable the rest of the data you're storing is. Passwords are always precious. I'm not going to name the large organizations that over the last few years have lost millions of passwords, but a very interesting resource that you can check is the site you can see here, this is a perfectly respectable site. It is not a malicious site. I'm recording this in the summer of 2015 and it's live at the time of recording. It may have gone away by the time you watch this video. And what it is, is a database compiled by a leading security expert called Mark Burnett. He's combined many of the password leaks that have happened publicly over the last few years and he's managed to gather 10 million passwords. 
The idea of the site is for good purposes. It's intended that by searching this database, you can find out if you've ever been compromised. You could try one of your usernames or passwords in here, and you can panic if it comes up with one of your passwords. Uh, notice that the domain part of any username has been removed, so it won't store any email addresses. I tried a few random combinations off camera. So for example, the username 19jethro23 happens to have been leaked previously, and they used a password of KT1. So if your username on any site is 19jethro23, then you need to go away and start changing your passwords right now. So that's quite sobering, and I realise that many of you have now switched the video off and are busy changing passwords, but if you're still with me, I'll stop lecturing now and I'll get on with showing you how you can protect passwords with Spring Security. What I'm going to do in this chapter is jump straight to a solution. We're going to use an algorithm called a key derivation algorithm, known as bcrypt, to store the password. And we'll see that switching this on in a Spring Security project is a pretty simple process and it won't take long. By the end of this chapter, and it's only about 30 minutes, your passwords will be stored in a format which at the time of the recording is considered resistant against the common forms of attack, in particular, brute force attacks. But in this chapter, I won't be explaining why. We'll just make it happen. We'll switch Bcrypt on and we'll see the results. But of course, I hope you will want to know why Bcrypt is the recommended algorithm to use today. And you might also want to know why the very commonly used algorithm called SHA-256 is today not considered suitable for password storage. It is a good algorithm but not for passwords, which is a bit surprising because there are many applications out there using it. I will be explaining all of the reasons why in the next chapter, we'll dive into the theory and understand exactly what Bcrypt is doing. Through this chapter, I'll keep using the phrase that at the time of this recording, Bcrypt is considered the current state of the art in password protection. I'm a bit nervous about saying that because, in fact, there are some new algorithms that have improved on what Bcrypt is doing. But we're always in a slightly difficult situation when we're doing cryptography, in that the newer algorithms might well claim to be better, but because they haven't been extensively used, people tend to be afraid to use them. So Bcrypt at the time of recording, and this will certainly change over the next few years, but Bcrypt at the moment is in the sweet spot in that it's old enough and it comes from 1999 and has been extensively used. For example, it is the default algorithm used on BSD Unix systems. So it's been extensively used, tried and tested. But if you're interested in learning further, you can check the Wikipedia article. There are other algorithms such as Scrypt, which have improved on this. But at the time of this recording, they're not in current use. What we need to do is to hash the passwords and never store the original plain text password. So a quick review of what a hash is if you haven't come across one before. A hashing algorithm will take a string, any string, and it will convert it into another string, which is a string of a fixed size. And this resulting hash will essentially look like a random string of characters. Well, I always say it looks like a random string of characters, but it's not a random algorithm, because the same input will always result in the same output hash. And that's a crucial property of a hashing algorithm. So it's certainly not random, even though the results look random. And the idea of a hash is they are easy to compute. Well, I'll say a few words about that later. 
but they're relatively easy to compute, but they're designed to be impossible to reverse. So if I give you a hash and challenge you to work out what the input was that resulted in that hash, then I would expect you to have to go away for an infinite amount of time. Now, I don't want to confuse you here, but I'm conscious that some of you watching this might have used bcrypt before. If you have, then you'll know that actually, bcrypt will always generate a completely different random string. So that looks like what I'm saying on this caption is incorrect. But the reason for that is bcrypt is more than a hash. bcrypt contains multiple components. And one of its components, just one of them, is a hash. If that's confused you, then it will be explained in detail in the next chapter. For now, I'm just talking about the general theory of hashing. And bcrypt, you can think of as a kind of a specific example of a hash, which has extra features built in. Let's just focus on basic hashes for the next few moments. And the way we will exploit a hash on our system is that when a user registers, so, and I'm using the stupid password of secret. So I'm going to send those credentials across to the server. Remember, I'm just signing up for an account here. And what our server will do is rather than storing RAC and secret, it will store RAC, but it will run the secret through the hashing algorithm. And out will come this apparently random series of characters, and it's the hash that we're going to store on the database. And the idea is, if at any point in the future, our database is compromised, stolen in other words, a malicious user might know what this hash is, but they should have absolutely no way of ever working out what the original password was. So we're going to store the username and the hash. How does our user authenticate themselves in future? Well, our user is going to come along with their username and password. Of course, they know their plain text password. And they're going to send that to the server in order to log in. Again, our server will need to capture that plain text password for a short period of time but we're only going to hold it in memory. and We're never going to store it in persistent storage. So how do we know if this password is correct? Well, it's dead simple, really. Our login logic will simply run the plain text password through the same hashing algorithm that was used before. And remember, the same input will always result in the same output. So we get this apparently random string of characters, and that is the string of characters that we compare with what's in the database. If we have a match, the user is authenticated. If we don't have a match, then they're not. And there are lots of hashing algorithms out there in the world. The first thing to say is do not ever, ever think about trying to implement your own hashing algorithm. Now, I know that might sound a bit patronizing, but plenty of people have tried to do this in the past and it really is a fool's errand because good hashing algorithms are incredibly difficult to design. And it's very easy to think you've come up with a perfect hashing algorithm only to find that it's easily breakable. There are plenty of standard algorithms out there in the real world that because they've been extensively used and extensively researched, their properties are well known. Well, as I said, without going into too much of the theory, I just want to leap straight in and say that the recommended algorithm to use at the time of this recording is bcrypt. So I'm going to do nothing more than show you how to switch bcrypt on in our Spring Security project, and then we'll talk about the theory behind it and what the alternatives are. Now, they've made it really easy to do this in Spring Security. If we go into our securityconfig.xml, we're down here where the authentication manager is. And the first thing we need to do is declare an instance of a bean. And I'm going to give it the name of bcrypt 
encoder. It doesn't really matter what you call the bean. And the class, I'm just working from the Spring Reference Manual here. They've provided a class which is capable of doing the bcrit hashing. The class name is org.springframework.security.crypto. I'm always misspelling these, so be careful here. And then there's another package called bcrypt. And then the class name is again bcrypt, but this time with a capital B and a capital C and password encoder. I know it sometimes looks like I can just remember these off the top of my head, but I am working with the reference manual just off camera and you can see the class name there. So if you prefer, you might want to copy and paste that from the reference manual. Once we've done that, we then just need to take our authentication provider and inside that tag, we add in the tag of password encoder. And this takes a ref and the ref is just going to be the bean that we just created right there. And what we've done there is we have told Spring Security to do this part of the process. Whenever a user logs in now, Spring Security will automatically run the plain password through the bcrypt hashing algorithm, and it will then compare the results of that with what's in the database. Well, we have a bit of a problem, and the problem is, of course, that the passwords in the database are all currently in plain text. So as things stand, what's going to happen when any of these users try to log in is they're going to be denied because of course the results of the hashing algorithm is not going to match what's stored here. But don't take my word for it, it's definitely worth deploying and let's see what happens. The stack trace here is just from a rehearsal a few minutes ago when I did indeed type the class name wrong. I'm back to the site, I'll attempt to view allbooks.do and a login as RAC and secrets invalid and I'll try Joe as well Joe and password yeah I simply can't get in and that's because there's two halves to this job the other half is we need to ensure that the password that we're storing in the database is hashed as well so I'm afraid unfortunately all of our existing users are currently redundant and I'm going to do nothing cleverer than delete from the users Oh, well, I forgot, I can't do that because I have a foreign key constraint. I'm going to also have to delete everything from, it's not roles, in fact, it's authorities, the default table name. So that's seven rows deleted from there. And then I can delete the six rows from the users table. So the other part of this job is we need to find our controller, the create account controller is where we're creating the user in the database. Instead of passing the plain text password into this user object, we want to hash it first. So how can we do that? Well, we're now into standard Spring Framework territory because we can use dependency injection. We know we've just created the bcrypt encoder in the factory that was here. I'll copy the class name there and we can inject it very easily using an auto wire. The bcrypt password encoder will need to be imported. I guess it's worth double checking that it really does exist. There it is with exactly the same package name that we used in the XML. And that gives us the ability now to create an encoded password. And that's going to be via a call on the encoder. Very simple, really. The method is just called encode. It takes in a char sequence. You might have been expecting a string there, but there is a good reason why the parameter type here is not a string. I'm just going to leave that hanging in the air for a little bit. Perhaps you might want to think in the back of your head about why they've not defined that as a string. It's a bit of a subtle point. 
but I'll come back to that later. But the char sequence is just standard Java, and in fact, the string class implements char sequence. So we can use our new user. That's the original form that contained the plain text, and we can call the get password method from there. And then instead of using the plain password, we will use the encoded one to center the database. So I reckon now, if we go back to our application, we'll create an account for RAC. And I'm going to continue to use that rubbish password of secret. And we'll create an account. Although we've created that account, it doesn't seem to have automatically logged us in programmatically. And that's the work we did in the previous chapter. So that's not good. We'll need to adjust that. But I think if we go into the database now and do a select all from the users table, well, this is excellent. Just check out the password in there. That's definitely what looks to me like a very random string of characters. It is certainly not the original plain text password. So the programmatic login, I'm afraid, didn't work, but we can try to log in manually. So if I try to go to the All Books page, I will now try to log in as RAC and secret, and we're in. So we have one fix to make there, but the bulk of it is working really well. Notice that the Add New Book is going to give a 403 denied, and that's simply because we've just registered RAC as a regular user. As things stand, there's no way of creating new administrators. That's not really a big deal in this app because we could just manually go into the authorities table and for the and authority, so we can put RAC into the role of admin. And we will need to log out again to make those changes take effect. And yeah, that's now working. So that's very good. The only problem is the programmatic login that we implemented in the previous chapter is now broken. And I can tell you that that's simply because I have a little bug in here. And if you have a good look at this code, you might be able to work it out for yourself. You might be thinking that what we have to do here on the line where we manually provide the credentials, the username and the password, to the authentication manager, you might think that, oh, well, we're going to have to hash this password. But remember that the authentication manager is automatically going to do the hashing because we configured the authentication manager to use bcrypt. So that is already happening. And if you just take a step back and think about the bug that I've introduced here, the user object is the one here. And actually, the user is created with an encoded password. So what we're actually doing here is we're sending the encoded password to the authentication manager. So the encoded password is going to get encoded again. It's the plain text password that we need to be passing in here. And we can still obtain that plain text password from the original form object, the object that we were calling new user. So a minor problem, really, but not too bad. Anyway, let's deploy that and see if our programmatic login now works. So we've done our user RAC. I'll now create an account for our user Joe, and their password will be just password. And now, fantastic, automatically logged in once they've created their account. And just to double check to make sure that the password for Joe looks like another random string of characters. 
And that's all the work that is needed to ensure that your passwords are considered safe at the time of this recording. I just want to show you one last thing before we delve into the theory here. Remember that Joe's plain text password is the literal string password. I wonder what would happen if I create another user. We'll make this one Joe too. But they're going to have exactly the same password of password. You'll have to take my word for it, but that was password. If I create them an account and go into the database, have a good look at the hashed passwords you can see there. The hashed passwords for Joe and Joe too. Well, the first bit looks the same, but after that, the characters are completely and utterly different. Now, I told you earlier that the same inputs to a hashing algorithm will always result in the same outputs. So clearly something strange is going on here. And in order to explain this, we're going to have to go into the theory of what's going on behind the scenes here. And that will mean explaining how salting works. If you're not interested in the theory, I want to point out that this is a really important property of a hash. Because if a malicious user were to look at this database, they cannot tell that Joe and Joe2 have identical passwords. If they were able to identify that they had identical passwords, then that would be a security breach. So the bcrypt algorithm has a very nice property. Even if users have the same password, we can't tell that that's the case just by looking at the hashes. Well, the way it's working is that bcrypt is not just a simple hash. It also contains something called a salt, and that is a necessary feature of any hashed password. Until recently, we had to apply salt manually, and that was tedious. So in this chapter, I aim just to show you how to switch bcrypt on. But I want to talk in detail about why bcrypt is so much better than other algorithms like SHA-256, which are still in common use. To do that, the next chapter will be covering the theory of hashing and salting, why you need to guard against brute force attacks.